uh, when Jesus said, I am throughout the book of John, and we certainly don't cover all of them. And I just want to encourage you that whenever you're reading the Bible and you see a place where Jesus says, I am, then remember that that is his eternal name. And one of the things that we really need to grasp in this study is how Jesus lives in the past, present, and future, God does simultaneously all the time. That's why we can say without a doubt, wherever we go, whatever we do, he goes before us preparing the way. He comes behind us sometimes cleaning up our mess, and he says he watches our back. And he also walks beside us. So we need, and that's what the name I am means. So it is his eternal name. I uh, thought about whether to put what I'm getting ready to say at the beginning or the end of reading the scripture. And I decided to put it at the beginning because I think if we understand what Jesus was saying when he said, I am the bread of life then as we study the scripture, it'll become crystal clear what he was saying. We'll be studying in the book of John, chapter 6. John, chapter 6. Bread of life means bread that provides life. The people uh, in the scripture that we'll be studying today, they're talking about physical hunger and bread, and Jesus is talking about spiritual hunger and bread. Do you remember that from last week, the woman at the well? Jesus was talking about spiritual water. She was talking about physical water. And the same thing with the bread today. We're In chapter 6, just to catch you up, there's a lot going on in chapter 6 of St. John. At the beginning of the uh, chapter, Jesus feeds, we call it the 5,000, but it was 5,000 men. So if each one was married and each one had one child, we're already up to 15,000. But Jesus fed them all. And uh, in, in the first part, of chapter 6. I would love for us to be able to go through the whole chapter, but there's just not time. So, uh, and then after that, remember uh, the disciples got in a boat. Uh, well, Jesus perceived that these people were going to make want to make him king, so he went off into a mountain by himself to, alone uh, to pray. And then the disciples got in the boat and they started across the uh, Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. And remember, a big storm came up and Jesus came walking on the water. So that happens in the first part of chapter 6. And then we will take up the story in, chap in verse 22. Chapter 6, verse 22. And we will be studying through verse uh, 52. 22 to 52. Might be 51. Oh, yes, it is. I looked at my sheet and it says 51. Okay, so 22 to 51. Okay, the crowd was there. We don't know how many thousands of people it actually represented. But it says the next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw the disciples had taken the only boat and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. 25, they found him on the other side of the lake and they asked, Rabbi, which is teacher, when did you get here? They never saw him all night. They didn't see him make the trip. And if you will notice, Jesus does not answer that question. 
Uh, he neither tells them when he got there, and he also doesn't tell them about the walking on the water, because the walking on the water, I believe, was a lesson for the disciples at that time. Today, it's a lesson to all of us. But at that time, I believe Jesus did that for his disciples because they truly believed. Remember that? Because the disciples struggled. Um, they believed, they were loyal, they were faithful, but they struggled. It was kind of like, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because what Jesus was telling them was a lot to swallow. And Jesus knew that. Verse 26, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. This is a solemn warning. And Jesus, in the remainder of this chapter, uses it four times. It's to get their attention. Jesus always told the truth. You know, when he tells us uh, in Scripture not to swear by this or by that, let your yes be yes and your no be no, it's when somebody, I, I swear on a stack of Bibles that that's so. Well, what if you don't swear on a stack of Bibles about something you say, then is that a lie? You know, he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So Jesus always tells the truth, but this is a common statement used at the time to get their attention, listen up, because what I'm getting ready to tell you is the truth. I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Oh, he doesn't pull any punches, does he? When did you get here? I tell you the truth. You just want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. Whatever Jesus, uh, however many people Jesus fed, it was out of that young, uh, out of that boy's lunch, then that was a miracle. But to those people, it was an easy, free meal. 27. But don't be concern, so concerned about perishable things like food. He says, he's not saying don't be concerned, you know. Everybody needs to put food on their table. He's saying don't be overly concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. So, and he would say the same to us today. Don't be overly concerned, because he did say it very clearly, about what you'll wear, what you'll eat. He said, don't be overly concerned about those things. He said, I'll supply all of those things. So the needs that we have for the food and, and clothing and housing, God said, I will provide don't be overly concerned about those things. Don't be overly concerned about amassing more stuff here uh, in this life. Because it's all going to be left behind anyway, isn't it? When we leave, my friends, we'll take nothing with us. And then what we had become, belongs to somebody else. And when they pass on, what they had will belong to somebody else. And it just passes on. Verse 28 said, they replied, well, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Folks, salvation by works does not work. It never has. But they said, well, we want God. You have God's approval. We want God's approval too. So tell us what works we need to do. Listen to this. This is a really important verse in this study today. Verse 29, Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Now, if, if God only wanted one thing from you, would you want to know what it is? If he only wanted one thing from you, I want to know what it is. Because you know what? He only wants one thing from you. And he only wants one thing from me. And here it is. Believe in the one he has sent. That's it. The rest of it's up to God, leading us and providing for us. Uh, 
when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he's saying that he is the source of spiritual satisfaction. So we need to regularly draw from him the nourishment that sustains our spirits. Not, we're not talking, he's not talking about our physical bodies. He's talking about our spiritual life and our spiritual bodies. And the bread that our spirits long for is always available as we come to Jesus for his provision. Okay, where is that nourishment that we long for? My friend, the day has come when it is not okay for God's people not to be reading God's word. There's too much going on now. It's funneling down and God to the uh, rapture and God wants us to know him to believe in the one that he sent, Jesus Christ, and we get to know God from reading the Bible. The only things that we know for sure about God are the things that he's told us in Scripture, and that's it. A lot of people have a lot of ideas, and we tend to think that God looks at things the way we do. You know, if I think that's funny, then he thinks that's funny. If he's, if I'm mad at you, then he's mad at you too, and it's just not so. He doesn't think like we do. We need to think like he does. We cannot save ourselves. There is not one thing, folks, that we can do about our sin. There's no way we can get rid of it because we cannot save ourselves. So how are we saved? By believing in the one he has sent. Who's that? Jesus. He made it so easy, but we make it so hard. They answered, show us. And I want to tell you right up front, as soon as I read this, I knew they shouldn't have said it. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you, if you want us to believe in you. Put on a show. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. Because they said, what can you do? Would you agree they're skating on thin ice? <laughs> After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. But see, what they don't notice is that well, what they're saying to the Lord is, let's do that first, if you're greater than Moses, then do greater things than he did. It sounded reasonable to them. You want us to believe in you? Well, if you're greater than Moses, then do greater things than what Moses did. Because Moses gave the Israelites manna for 40 years. That's what they said. But see, what they also don't stop to think about is that many of the people that ate the manna every day, at first it was a big blessing. They really praised the Lord for it. But then it got old and they got tired of it and they got to where they despised it. They ate it every day. God provided it every day. But they didn't like it anymore. And a great percentage of those people, you know, because all the first generation died off. It was the second generation that went into the promised land. So most of them who ate the manna, participated in the miracle, did not believe. So it's not the size of the miracle, whether it was providing manna for 40 years or feeding who knows how many thousand people with a with a boy's lunch, it's not the size of the miracle because they ate the lunch, but they haven't believed either. But in verse 32, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. So what he's saying, he's getting to tell him, you just made a big boo boo. I tell you the truth, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, my father did. He said, don't make any mistakes. Moses didn't do it. And Moses, I mean, Jesus didn't say this. I'm saying this. Moses himself would say, I didn't do it. God did it. But look at this. My father did, and now 
he offers you the true bread from heaven. So Jesus said, God, God not only gave that manna to your ancestors, he is still giving manna today. He's still doing what he has always done. Now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And who did that? Jesus himself, the one who was speaking. They still don't get it. Because verse 34 says, Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Is that not what the woman at the well said? Well, let me have that. Let me have that water. I won't ever have to draw water again. I'll never be thirsty. They said, you know, Moses, they thought, provided uh, man in the wilderness for 40 years. We want you to do it from now on. Every day. Give us that bread so that we won't. Be. Give it to us every day. You fed us yesterday. Feed us today. Feed us tomorrow. And then feed us the next day. And every single day after that. Jesus replied, and here it is, I am the bread of life. Put it out there very plainly to them. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He's talking about the spiritual. They are stuck in the physical. So, they're, uh, they're not connecting with what he is saying. Verse 36 says, But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. He said, You see me? We're talking. I fed you yesterday. And in spite of the fact that you have seen me and you have seen miracles, Jesus himself said, You still don't believe. Remember when he told uh, Thomas, Jesus told him there in the upper room after the resurrection, he said, Thomas, because you have believed, or because you have seen, you have believed, but blessed are those who believe who have not seen. You know what Jesus was saying? Bless you and you and you and you and you and you. Bless me because we have believed, although we have never seen but I'll tell you what, he has blessed us with this. We see him with spiritual eyes, don't we? We just don't see him with physical eyes. And that's another reason. We need to spend time in this book. There's a lot in these last days, I believe, that God desires to tell us. But if we don't pick up the Bible and open it, you know, pastor can't in 30 minutes on Sunday morning tell you everything that this Bible says, and you take the time, you take the 30 minutes in here and the 30 minutes in there, in an hour a week, you can't, we can't teach all this. So we need, you need to be in it on your own, asking God, you know, before you read God's word, let me make a really uh, strong suggestion to you. Pray over it before you read it, asking God to show you what you need to see from what you're going to read. Because he said, read it like you're looking for a, a hidden treasure. Because my friend, those treasures are in there and he will reveal them to you. Why? Because he is the bread of life. He is the one who sustains us. Verse 37, however, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. Anybody who comes to Jesus, Jesus said, I will never. He's telling us the truth here. He said, I will never reject anyone who comes to me. And you have people say, oh, you don't know what I've done. I've been so bad. God could never forgive that. Well, that's where God does some of his best work. Because anybody that comes to him, it doesn't make any difference what their past is. It doesn't make any difference how bad it is. When they come to him, he never rejects anyone. 
Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven. Uh-oh, they, they hear this, and they have a problem with it. But Jesus said it so they could hear it, even though they would have a problem with it. He said, for I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. Okay, their half went up a little bit at that. I'll show you in a minute. I'm not just supposing that. Scripture tells us. Verse 39, And this, Jesus is still speaking, and this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but I should raise them up at the last day. Let me uh, make a suggestion to you. John chapter 17 is one of the sweetest chapters in the Bible. Do you know what it is? It's the prayer that Jesus prayed just before the crucifixion. And he said in that prayer, he said, Lord, I don't want to lose a single one. And then over in um, uh, John, uh, or He says it again, I believe it's John 18, that, uh, that he didn't want to lose one. So you remember the parable where there were a hundred sheep, one wandered off? What did Jesus do? Went after him. Why? Because he's going to lose even one. So whether that one is you, whether that one is me, we are safe in the hands of Jesus because Jesus said, I'm not going to lose one that my Father has given me, and I will raise them up. So we don't have to worry about getting lost in the shuffle because God, Jesus said, I won't lose any, and I will raise them on the last day. Verse number 40, for it is my Father's will. Now, Jesus said, for it is my Father's will, and that raises their hackles. But to you and me, I want to say, when Jesus said, for it is my Father's will, don't you want to know what it is? Why well, I do. If God has a will in a situation, I want to know what it is. And Jesus so plainly tells us, for it is my Father's will that all, and that word means all, everybody, who sees his Son and believes in him should have eternal life. That's God's will. That everybody every last person that all who see his son and believe it's not enough just to say i know jesus we have to believe in the life he lived and the works he did and in his resurrection so if we see and believe in him we should have eternal life and he says it again I will raise them up at the last day. Boy, we have a hope, don't we? We have a positive future. And that is God's will for us. That's God's will for me. It's his will that I see his son and believe in him so that I will have eternal life and that Jesus will raise me up on the last day. That is God the Father. That is God's will for you that, you, that you see and believe so that he can raise you up at the last day. Verse 41, and then the people began to murmur disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now they're familiar with manna the stories of it. But they begin to murmur in disagreement because he said that. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph? Is he? No. He's not Joseph's son. But they don't understand or know about the virgin birth. We do. He wasn't just a son. He's God's son. I think Joseph was probably one of the most godly men of his time. And I think he did everything he could do 
wanted to protect Mary and Jesus from everything he could protect them from. I think he was a good man, but he, and he was not Jesus' father, and he, of all people, knew it because the angel had told him. But he appeared to be Joseph's son. They didn't understand or know about, they would know about the virgin birth if they'd read, if they knew it from the Old Testament and believed it, they would have known. But just living in the day, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, the carpenter? We know his father and his mother. So how can he say, I came down from heaven? I can see how they would think that, living in the, the day that they did. And I can also see why God had Jesus come into this world the way he did. You know, why, why not with thunder and lightning and just a great big entrance? Fix everything. Instead of coming as a baby to, to Mary and Joseph, Verse 43, but Jesus replied, stop complaining. You know what? I think Jesus would say to us today, stop complaining. There's a lot of good things in the world. See them, talk about them. Stop complaining about everything that's wrong. Because when we complain about what's wrong, we are in essence saying, I think this may be a little bit out of God's control. And it's not out of his control, this world is. And he told us that these things that are happening now were going to come to pass. He's in total charge of it. And we need to look at the good things in life. We need to say good things about people. We need to love people. We need to draw together and pull together and quit pulling apart. So he said to them, stop complaining. He rebuked them for grumbling. Stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. I think Jesus is excited about when he's going to do that, don't you? When this is all over and he's going to raise us from the dead, that's about the third or fourth time he's mentioned it right here. I'm going to raise them on the last day. I think he's excited about it. Are we excited about it? I think we should be excited about it. If our Lord is excited about doing it, we should be excited about being a part of it. Verse 45, as it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Okay, so nobody can be saved without divine help, drawing them and teaching them. Okay, then who does God draw? Do you remember what Jesus said? If I be lifted up, what? I will draw all men unto me. So everybody in this world gets an opportunity to be saved, at least one. I think it can be dangerous to continue to reject and reject and reject. If you know the truth, my friend, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior and get that taken care of. And then it said, as they will all be taught by God. You see, God teaches us even how to be saved, how to accept him. We are taught by him so that we can understand how to uh, be his child and come into his family. He says, everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. God teaches us about Jesus. And if we hear and believe, then it says everybody that the Father teaches, that they listen to the Father and learn from him, See, there's an and in there. There's two steps to it. You listen to the Father and you learn from him as he teaches you. That everyone that uh, listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. 46. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, 
have seen him. God the Father did not come down in a body that could be seen. The Father was working through the Son. Jesus is the one that God, God the Father has not been seen. He didn't uh, take on a human body and walk this earth. God the Son did, Jesus. Verse 47, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Oh, there it is. He said, I tell you the truth. That means listen up. You need to know this. It's the truth. Anyone back then or today, anyone who believes has eternal life. It's a promise. Verse 48, yes, he said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. It was physical food. Anyone, for, verse 50, who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. He was talking about spiritual nourishment. He is the spiritual nourishment, the bread, spiritual bread that satisfies our hunger for spiritual things. He is the one who uh, provides, uh, helps us to survive in our Christian life. You know, last week he said, I am Messiah, the promised one. That means he brought salvation. But when he said, I am the bread of life, he said, now after you're, you're saved, I will continue to nourish you and grow you and and teach you he said, I will continue to work in you. The only thing I ask of you is that you believe in me. And Jesus said, I'll do the rest. I'll tell you, folks, this Christian life is the easiest thing. I mean, not, all, not everything that happens is good, but it's the easiest thing because God asks very little of us, only that we believe and fix our eyes on him and watch him work. So he, uh, last week's lesson was about salvation. This week's lesson is about survival, about, uh, about living. Jesus says the bread of life provides the nourishment that physical food provides for our body. He's drawing a, a simile that, uh, that it's the uh, thing. It's like physical food nourishes and helps you to live a physical life then he said spiritual food jesus will help you in your spiritual life without physical food we become weak and will eventually die and without jesus we weaken spiritually that's why it's important to read and study god's word because i'm going to tell you something that I'm going to tell you the truth. If you spend time in this book, you will grow. You won't be able to stop it. You won't be able to help it. Just like a brand new baby, if that baby is well fed physically, can, can that baby keep from growing? No. He doesn't have anything to do with it because he is fed and he eats, he grows. And my friend, if we're fed and we eat, don't count on somebody else to feed you. I would tell you this. I hope I don't offend anybody, but one of my very least favorite statements is, well, I quit going to that church. I just wasn't being fed. Don't count on somebody else to feed you. That's your job. That's why he gave us this. It's your job to feed yourself. And when you do, I can promise you that you will grow. You won't be able to keep from it. 
you can stop it if you wanted to or if you tried, which you wouldn't. So he realized the power of this book of his word. And he said, just believe. I'm the bread of life. Here it is, folks. Read this and you'll be nourished spiritually. Study this and you'll get to know me better, Jesus said. We're blessed. And we certainly need to take advantage of it. What if they came and took your Bibles? Would you wish you had read it? If they came and took every Bible out of my house, you know what I'd wish? That I'd memorize more of it. That I'd spend more time in it. You know what I'd be praying? That God would help me to remember everything I knew about it. It's not enough to have a Bible in your house. We need to be reading them and studying them. And Jesus said on the last day, I will rise them up. We're going to be there for that because he said, I won't lose one, not a single one. And if Jesus says it, it's the truth. So we are going to be there. And I think it's right around the corner. I hope it is. Because then, I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heartaches have truly vanished away. We'll enjoy all the beauty where all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. Thank you.